here at Siegel. So I'm going to talk today about joint work with Stephen Bigelow, Emily Peters, and, and Noah Snyder. Um, and I'll just say right at the beginning, actually, that everything we do here follows very closely uh, some work that Emily Peters did on the, the hyperplanar algebra. And she has a great paper that's already out uh, explaining all these techniques. Uh, and we're basically just doing a slightly harder case here to get through some time. Let's get started. Okay. First of all, I'm going to uh, just give you a, a brief overview of subfactors for native speakers of tensor categories. I'll just give a very quick dictionary so that you'll understand all the pictures that I, that I draw later in the talk. And after that, uh, I'll talk about uh, a classification result for subfactors. Uh, the index, and you can, you can get five some results. And then I'll uh, give an, uh, an overview of how you might uh, Try and construct planar algebra, or construct subfactors using planar algebra techniques. And then in the last section, I'll uh, do the actual details for this uh, mysterious extended hybrid of subfactor. And that has some pretty cool screen theory and some, and some nice pictures to do. But first of all, and how do we translate? Well, the theorem, due to uh, a bunch of people, Papa uh, Rockyan and Germans, I guess, uh, various bits of it. Uh, Extremal finite index 2 1 subfactors correspond to unit, unitary spherical categories or tensor categories, but with two types of tensor property. Uh, and a chosen generator, uh, it's a X, which is a left A object and a right B object. So when we say there are two different tensor products, that is, every object is a left label and a right label, and you can only take tensor products when the labels match up. Uh, this might sound like a, a funny thing saying with the chosen generator, uh, X, but really it's somehow the essential difference uh, between thinking about unitary spherical tensor categories and planar algebras. Looking at the, 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 the tensor category from the point of view of a particular generator uh, suggests different techniques, and you'll, you'll see what I'm talking about as we go through. Let's just finish the, the dictionary here. The index of the subfactor, A inside B, is uh, just the square of the quantum dimension of the, the chosen generator. We'll talk about the principal graph of a subfactor. There's actually a pair of principal graphs. Uh, so people say the principal graph and the dual principal graph. And this just tells you the types of products of an arbitrary object with your chosen generator on the right. Uh, and I guess there are, there are two cases here. You can, uh, if V is a right A object, you tensor on the right and X, but if V is a right V object, you have to tensor on the right. Uh, now, the, you can take the even part of one of these A, B tensor categories, which is just the subcategory of all the AA objects. It's called the even part. And of course, you can alternatively take the BB objects. And that's a, the even part of the dual is what people would usually say, I guess. Now, the double of the even part is, of course, a modular tensor category, just because it doubles out. And uh, the things to say here, well, first of all, it doesn't matter which of the two even parts you take, because just having the subfactor and this uh, and, and these mixed modules, these AB my modules, gives you a Marita equivalence between the two different even parts, and so that means the doubles are at the same. So we really have one double coming from each other. And these modular tensor categories that you get from some of the, the strange examples of subfactors look kind of weird, and there's some evidence that they, they might be exotic, that is, they don't come from quantum uh, groups by some list of construction. They don't that there's this, this paper of, of Hong Rao and, and, and Rob that does some of that. Uh, but there's probably lots more to be said in this direction about uh, uh, describing the modular tensor categories from subfactors in terms of the modular constructions. Here's uh, another version of this, well, another dictionary, this time telling you how to, how to translate pictures between the two different worlds. The left column is just the standard setup. Uh, so in this picture here, uh, F, G, and H are meant to be morphisms in the category. So, for example, uh, F up here, you should think of some morphism from B, tensor, C dual, because the arrow is going down, tensor, well, whatever label is missing on that strand, and so on. Uh, and, and you'll notice that uh, in this picture, I haven't distinguished the sources and targets of morphisms. Um, so maybe you should think of these, these Fs and Gs as Hs as maybe being elements of some space of invariance in the tensor category. Because we're in a, a spherical tensor category, the distinction between sources and targets isn't really relevant, so it's nice to draw all the invariances. 
Over on the right hand side, things are a little bit different. Uh, first of all, the edges aren't, lit, aren't oriented, and moreover, the regions are alternately shaded or unshaded, and the, these shadings correspond to the, the left uh, and right A and B labels. Uh, and where on the left hand side you have many home spaces between arbitrary tensor products of objects. On the right, there's just a, a, a family of vector spaces, these PK, well, ignore the plus or minus. PK uh, is just the vector space of all pictures that you can put in the disk with, uh, with K boundary points, and the region is alternately uh, uh, white. Oh, right, sorry, sorry. If I say that, uh, I'll tell lines later. Um, because of this shading here, all of the, the disks have an even number of boundary points automatically, and so our convention actually is that PK is the disk space with 2K points around the boundary. And the plus or minus here, well, you have two different spaces depending on whether the uh, uh, marked point is in the shaded or unshaded region. That just tells you where to start reading a social tensor product. Okay. Now, how do you go back and forth between these, these two different types of pictures? Well, if you have a spherical tensor category, uh, with two sorts of objects, well, sorry, with two sorts of shadings, but maybe many objects, you can choose your favorite generator and, and look at that, and that tells you, well, let's go to the subcategory, the full subcategory where the objects are just tensor powers of your favorite generator. Uh, every, every object appears inside that if it really is a generator, a tensor generator, but we don't allow those as, as objects when we think in, in the plane of algebra. So how do you go back again? Well, if you have some, some tensor category where the objects are just powers of x, uh, you can always form the item code of completion. That is, throw back in all of the objects, which are, uh, or throw back in as objects to all of the item codes in this category. So if one of these tensor products, for example, is a direct sum, these, these sum ends might not exist in this setting, but they always exist as item codes in the, in the spaces here. So you can go back by taking that. Hopefully, the features I draw. Okay, so the classification result up to index three plus square root three. So this is the this means that in the category there's some object whose dimension is smaller than the square root of the index. So in 1994, Algor published this list uh, of possible principal graphs of subfactors of index less than three plus root three. Now uh, there's one family, uh, there's one family here. Uh, these are all the same graph except the initial arm has different lengths, changing by Thinking more for. There's this single graph here, and there's another family of graphs. Again, just the initial arm is increasing in, in uh, steps of four. Now, uh, the first two, well, these ones highlighted in uh, green here, were constructed by Hagerup and Seder and Hagerup in 1999. Uh, and then a little bit later, uh, Bush and very recently uh, Seder and Yusuda have ruled out infinite families. Uh, Bush ruled out this entire uh, family of possible principal graphs here. Um, and conceptually, it's very simple. He just shows that there's no possible fusion algebra uh, extending the, the, the tensor product encoded in that graph. And then uh, Asedo and Yasuda um, have a, a great paper where they uh, use a bunch of number theory to show that all of these graphs from this guy out are impossible. Uh, that leaves one guy in the middle, which uh, until recently no one really knew whether it existed or not. And so today, we're going to fill in this last step of the, the classification to show this guy really uh, Now, uh, I just want to say a tiny, tiny bit about the previous constructions that have been done. Um, just in mind of the words. So Seder and Hagrup find a bi-unitary flat connection. So this is in Okniyanus and Karakut formulas. And Ikeda, in 98, actually provided some numerical evidence that this last remaining graph really did have a corresponding subfactor. He, uh, he found a, a flat connection uh, by a bunch of numerical calculations, and he says it exists up to 10 to the minus 19. <laughs> but uh, I think everyone, everyone immediately took that as, as really good evidence that it, it was there. I mean, it, it couldn't, it couldn't, he couldn't have got his results. Now, well, anyway. Uh, our techniques are totally different from, from these ones. And uh, I'll just say here that, like Ikeda, we do use a computer uh, in, the, in the course of our construction. And in fact, in finding, uh, well, in 
find a, a particular generator, we're going to need to find, and as I'll explain later, we really use a computer a lot, I mean, a, a day of computer time. Uh, but at the end, there's, uh, there's really very little of the computer being used in the proof that I'm going to explain to you. There are some really large matrices we need to multiply and then take traces of, and we need, still need a computer to do that for us. Uh, we're not multiplying thousand by thousand matrices by hand. Uh, but that's all the computer does, it, and, it, and it's using it exactly. Okay, so how does one construct a planar algebra? Well, this is sort of the big idea. Now that we know about how to translate subfactors to subfactor language into planar algebra language, we can just give scheme theoretic uh, constructions of subfactors. That is, we can write down a generator uh, uh, that is a, a some, some some box, and, and then write down a bunch of relations for planar combinations of this box, and. This talk is going to illustrate a technique for showing that, that these sort of constructions really work. Now, if you're going to write down generators and relations, you need to you need to have some idea of what sort of generators and relations to write down. And uh, Jones is working in two papers. Uh, they're I think both on his website, but not on the archive. Uh, on annular and quadratic tangles, actually gives you a, an awful lot of information about what the generators and relations are. In a planar algebra should look like. Uh, and most of this information comes directly from the principal graph. So you can learn, you can learn quite a lot very quickly. And uh, as I said before, uh, Emily Peters has, has done this in the, for the high group subfactor. And there's an archive there reference there. If you should uh, look up if you're interested in any details that I say in this talk. Uh, okay, so what is this information that we get about, about generators and relations uh, by thinking about, about planar algebra? So first of all, we need this notion of the annular temporary leap category. So this is uh, temporary leap is just usually string diagrams in a rectangle uh, where you can remove a loop for a factor of twelve. The annular temporary leap category is just the same diagrams with the same relations between them and annuals. Now, uh, if you think about the annular temporary leap category, you can, uh, you can quickly work out that every representation of this category breaks up as a direct sum of representations generated by lowest weight vectors. So our lowest weight vector, T, K, lambda, is something satisfying these relations here. First of all, any way of, of capping off the generator, producing a smaller box, so here, I guess K is, K is 4 in this case, with the eight boundary points. So capping off takes you from P4 down to P3. Any way of capping off is 0, and your rotational eigenvector, then that's, that's a lowest weight vector. Okay, since, since the planar algebra itself has to be a representation of annular temporary value, you can act by these diagrams on any, uh, act by these diagrams on any, on any, uh, any one of the planar algebra, the whole planar algebra has to be generated by elements like this. And uh, I'm going to start with, uh, let me say a little bit more about uh, annular temporary value and some terminology we'll use later. If you have a low weight vector, let's uh, write ATL plus 1 of T for the annular consequences of T one level up. So that is, here T is in P5, it has oh, oh. Uh, my numbers are all wrong in the text there, sorry. Here, I should have said T is in P4, and we're talking about the annular consequences in P5. So T here has eight boundary points, that's something in P4. But now you can add a cap anywhere, uh, add a cup anywhere around the boundary to produce an element in P5. Uh, so, yeah. any. Oh, yep. I'm sorry. Uh, how many annular consequences should there be? Um, well, oh, sorry, I'm not sure. Are you just saying people because yeah. they are in common? Yeah. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Yes. So, so, T here. T here is the lowest weight vector. If T lives in P4 oh, because it has eight yeah. boundary points. And now we're taking various images of T in the, the next space up. So we're looking at uh, this element is in P5 while T was in P4. And the, the, the lovely lemma about representations of, uh, of the annular temporary leap category is that as long as delta is less than 2, uh, this fails in the, than the ADE cases when you're below index 4, uh, the annular consequences of a lowest weight vector the annular consequences at any height, so we can add lots of nested cups all around the boundary, they're all linearly independent. And this is great because 
it lets us count the dimensions of a representation of annular temporal image. We know we have uh, a low weight vector for some value of k. We can compute the dimensions of this representation in all of the higher disk spaces just by counting the ways of inserting caps. OK. Knowing now the dimensions of annular temporal leave, and knowing that the whole plane of algebra breaks up as these representations, we can deduce that there are certain relations between uh, quadratic tangles. So just by counting dimensions in the, uh, the extended Hydra uh, plane of algebra, um, so you, you can work out the dimensions of P at any level just by looking at the principal graph and counting paths on that. Uh, we can just sort of do a, a, a lowest weight decomposition and see that, that as, an annual, as a representation of annual temporal leave, it starts like this. There's the, there's, the empty represent, there's the representation generated by the empty picture and all of the consequences you get then are just in the temporal leave. But then there's another generator with 16 boundary points and eigenvalue minus one. So when you rotate by, by two clicks, it changes by the sign. And then there's more stuff. Uh, I should say here that the, the, the title is quadratic tangles. This really isn't something from Vaughan's quadratic tangles paper. This is still sort of the annular angle sort of idea. Um, <coughs> if you want to know how I knew that that eigenvalue was minus one, then you should read this quadratic tangles paper. And then there's more. Oh, so let's have a look at this. T has 16 boundary points. So let's look at this guy. We're doing what, two copies of T up by eight strings. This still lives in P8. And that means that it's got to live in well, the annual consequences of this, that's all temporally leave, and, well, in, and some multiple of the generator of this guy. That tells us that this guy, t squared, is just temporally leave plus t. So let's look one level up. Let's look at two t's connected by seven strands. There's no lowest weight vector in uh, p sub nine, and so this, this thing here must be a linear combination of temporally leave and the annual consequences. So there's going to be some linear relation there that lets us replace two t's with a single t, as long as they're connected by these seven strands. And now let's look one level up. Let's connect two t's by six strands. There's still 20 strands around the edge, so we're in p10 now. We know that in p10, all that there are are annular consequences of the, the first two low weight vectors, and this single low weight, new lowest weight vector in p10. Now that means that these two guys here, uh, well, some linear combination of them, those two guys, must just be uh, annular consequences of all this stuff. Well, I mean, I'm lying a little bit. Uh, I can't guarantee, maybe I can't guarantee that there isn't some linear dependence between these things, but that would be a very special case and we can see that things go wrong. Okay, so now what this says is that if you can see two t's connected by six strands, you can replace them by two t's also connected by six strands, one plus four plus one, but in a slightly different way at the expense of lots of terms with fewer t's. Okay. okay, so now we have some idea of what sort of relations we have to expect for any, uh, for any generator of the, uh, the extended hardware. Suppose I give you such a uh, sector generator and I can show that it satisfies these sorts of relations. How do we tell that it really is what we want, the extended hardware plane of algebra? Well, it's kind of easy. If we can show that the, the plane of algebra I've given you is a sub-factor plane of algebra, uh, maybe I should have said this earlier, so the axioms we need for it to be a sub-factor plane of algebra are that it's unitary, that it's spherical, and the dimension of the zero space is one dimension. That is, sort of the, the, the tensor identity is, is simple. Uh, if we can show it's a subfactor plane of algebra with the correct index, then Hargrove's classification guarantees it's going to be the right thing. We can't get it wrong. But if I give you a, an explicit plane of algebra, um, you can also compute the principal graph by hand, although it's a lot of work and we certainly haven't done it. So you could prove that this does have the, the right principal graph without appealing to the classification. Hopefully. Uh, maybe someone can yes. Uh, okay. We're left with the problem. How do we know that some plane of algebra is a subfactor plane of algebra? Uh, oh, okay, I guess I, I should have said. Here's a, here's a really important thing. If I give you a plane of algebra specified by generators and relations, your first question should be, are the relations consistent? Does the whole thing just collapse down to zero? So we've got to check that first, that there really are non-zero things. Uh, 
uh, is the planar algebra unitary, and is the dimension of the zero box space one. Saying the dimension of the zero box space is one is just saying that you can take any closed diagram, and the relations that you specify are sufficient to evaluate everything in terms of multiple of the How do we answer these questions? The first two are really hard uh, from a scheme theory point of view, so we have to do something else. If we can find an element t inside of a big planar algebra, not necessarily a subfactor planar algebra, but some subfactor planar algebra, and we know that big planar algebra is unitary and spherical, then we're guaranteed that the, the subplanar algebra generated by t is still unitary and spherical. So that's going to be our strategy, and there's unfortunately an obvious place to look uh, in this bigger planar algebra. Every time you have a subfactor planar algebra p, you can compute its principal graph, so I'll write gamma of p, I guess, and there's a thing called the graph planar algebra, which is, just depends on a bipartite graph. You hand it, give me a bipartite graph, I'll give you this big planar algebra. And the theorem is that every sub, sub factor planar algebra is some sub algebra of the graph planar algebra of its principal graph. So you're going to look for a, some element of this graph planar algebra. Uh, sub fact, the, the sub algebra generated by it will automatically be unitary and spherical. And then we're left with this last problem can we evaluate those diagrams? Uh, and if we, well, that's going to require some clever scene theory. If we can, we have what we want. Let me briefly tell you about the graph planar algebra. Um, so, given a bipartite graph gamma, the spaces in, uh, in, in the graph planar algebra, the k space, is just all linear combinations of length 2k loops on gamma. Uh, I guess there's a technical point of so the, the, if you're looking at the, the k plus space, then the loop should start at an even vertex in the graph, while if you're looking at a k minus space, the loop should start on, a, on, an, odd, on an odd vertex in the graph. And there's some action of the, 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 the template of the operad on these spaces, um, which is pretty simple, and it's sort of a state sum model, and there are some coefficients that can depend on, on the growing convenience aspect of the graph. But the details of that won't actually matter. The, the relatively easy theorem is that the graph planar algebra is always unitary and always spherical. Uh, it's not a subfactor planar algebra because its zero box space is way too big. Uh, GPA zero, well, that's just length zero loops on the on the graph uh, that are based on even vertices. So it's just the number of even vertices. And of course, that's more than one for most most graphs. Uh, just to give you an idea of how big these these guys are. Here, H is meant to stand for Hug group, and if you look in the, the four box space for Hug group, which is where the, the generator for the Hug group planar algebra should live, that's a 375 dimensional space. So to construct Hug group, you're looking for some special element of that. And for extended Hug group, you have to look in the eighth space to get a box with 16 strands. You're, you're trying to find some particular element of 150,000 dimensional space. Somewhat more painful. Uh, so, Let's start looking for this element now. In this, in the, in the, oh, sorry. I guess that's a half over there. This 16 should be in 8. We're looking in the 8 box space. 16 points on the back. OK. We know that we were looking for a generator with rotational eigenvalue minus 1. When we look at just the, the equations uh, for a lowest weight vector, uh, we can solve these relatively easily on a computer in this 150,000 dimensional space, and we get down to a 19 dimensional space. <coughs> Things are already looking a little bit better. Now, uh, I showed you uh, a bunch of relations that uh, had to be satisfied by, um, uh, by t squared with eight strands or seven strands or six strands connecting them. And using any of those, you can very quickly uh, deduce that actually t squared is on the nose equal to uh, the 16th transmental line. Now, looking at all of the, the, the coefficients of this guy in the graph planar algebra, that's 150,000 quadratic equations on, on T, and, um, well, obviously that's massively overdetermined. And, uh, if you don't believe in extended hard group, you shouldn't expect there to be a solution. But, well, by, uh, by ad hoc methods, I've said here, which translates into several days of staring at quadratics and solving some by hand, and, solving others by Newton's method and then guessing plausible looking exact solutions from what Newton's method showed up and, and a, a real zoo of, of stuff. We find a, a, uh, we find a solution. Uh, notice I didn't get to write on this slide 
find a unique solution to these quadratics because we used to that off methods that you know, we couldn't prove that there's nothing else. We might have to use that. Okay. We've found, we found something. And either this thing generates extended high growth or whatever. Okay. So at this point, forget what I just said about all these days of work playing with a computer and trying to solve quadratics by hook or by hook. We've got some guy, and uh, we have an explicit description that's relatively easy right now, even though it's in this huge vector space. It's not really bad. Um, actually, let, let me, um, yeah, let me just flick through the slides, which show the generator, just so you can see what sort of thing it looks like. So we need to give its value on all these 150,000 loops. So it all comes down to um, this part here is the trick that lets you write it down person. If gamma is some path on the principal graph, it spends some amount of time in each of the three legs of the graph. Remember, the graph is just a trivalent vertex so legs of different lengths. And so we can just produce this word, 0, 1, 2, that just tells you the amount of time it spends in each of the three legs. And it turns out the coefficient of a path uh, basically only depends, well, except for some sort of easy factors, on, on uh, the time it spends in it. So I'm just going to have to tell you these numbers, p sub gamma hat. And so if you write down 21 of them, they're very mysterious numbers of these. Oh, yeah. And they're very mysterious, but I mean, they're low degree polynomials with small energy coefficients. It's not, not as bad as it could be. Uh, and then you extend the, those 21 definitions to some other, defi some other definitions for arbitrary words in, in, in 0 and 1, and then, and then by some more rules to all these words. And, that tells you that the generator uh, explicitly. Okay, so back here. Uh, once you've written this down explicitly, you can check by hand the thing you produced really is a low weight, uh, a low weight vector. Uh, you don't need you don't need a computer to do that. From the nice compact the description I gave before, you can really do it yourself. Uh, we know the subalgebra is non-trivial and unitary. Uh, you just need to check that those diagrams can be evaluated. So. Let's get our hands dirty and do some real scan theory. Uh, it, it's only really at this point that, uh, that what we're doing becomes specific to extended half. So far, it's just sort of in the general model to construct these linear algebras from the principal graph. From the, uh, this generator, first of all, I'm going to compute six numbers. And here's where we take a couple of hours of computing time uh, multiplying matrices and computing faces. So, squared and t cubed and t to the fourth here, um, these are just the products, uh, the, the, those powers there mean cranking up t's by, by eight strands. Okay? So the, these powers are still the same size boxes as t's, and the trace just means uh, close up this way. That's, that's t squared. Okay, so we calculate these numbers, and then these three numbers, row to the one half is the one click rotation of t. So t is a, a guy here, we bring one strand that way, one strand that way. And notice now that if t was unshaded in this region, it's now uh, it's now shaded in this in this region. So the half click rotation lives in a different space in the planar algebra. But again, we compute some traces uh, and get some more slightly mysterious numbers. We're done with the computer. Uh, you just have to be a, a dedicated user of, of Bessel's inequality, and, uh, and you can derive these relations. What do they look like? On the, on the left-hand side, here we have an S with 16 strands coming down, an extra arc over the top, and then a, an 18-strand an Jones Hansel line on the bottom. Uh, unfortunately, these pictures don't have strands coming down at the bottom there. On the right-hand side, there are two S's connected by six strands, and then it turns into and curve on the bottom. And these two terms are just equal up to a model. Uh, why are things like this true? Well, imagine now uh, taking this F18 and expanding it in terms of all the typical lead diagrams. Nearly all of the terms cancel straight away because they involve a little cup at the top of the Jones Mendel atom, but it comes up and collides with the S and kills it because it's a lowest weight vector. So when you expand these Jones Mendel atoms, they're actually quite a relatively few terms on either side, and you just see this, uh, this sort of relation that we expected before, that S connected by, two S's connected by seven strands 
uh, is often a combination of um, of um, annual consequences of x. So there's x plus the cap. Oh, we also get this other relation um, because of the x2 arc as well. Now something important to notice here, which is sort of subtle but actually really relevant to uh, to both hardware and extended hardware, is that this relation here only holds in the shading that I've drawn. That is, if you reverse all the shadings in these pictures, there's no relation between those, those two diagrams. Now, this is something a little strange, and sort of for a generic principal graph with a split, you'd expect that there are actually both sorts of relations. The explanation for it is that when you write this guy in terms of two answers connected by seven strands, in terms of annular consequences of t, one of those terms has coefficient to zero, and so you can't then write that term in terms of the, uh, the two S's. Uh, this is what I've said, that certain coefficient is unexpected in zero. It's not so unexpected. I mean, you can, you, can, you can know this ahead of time by thinking about the principal graph and working the work you can do because that tangles uh, But it's something special about it. What we can do, though, is take this relation here and substitute it, substitute it into the second relation. Notice over here, there's an S that's shaded above and a single strand above. So we'll stick this guy. First of all, we'll expand out all the Jones Mansell light inverters there, and then substitute this term into there. We get uh, some pretty ridiculous relations. Um, so let me just write them schematically here. If you have a generated T and two arcs above it, you can write it as some linear combination of terms with 0, 1, 2, or 3 t's in them. The t's are all at the top, and they're just connected to the bottom by some element of temporal linear. Um, say, for example, this element, x3 here in temporal linear, uh, that's an element of uh, how many strands does it have around the boundary? 16 times 4 plus 4. So it's an element of tl68. So you might think this is horrible, and specifying this x3 requires writing down however many coefficients, however many coefficients the dimension of tl68 is. There's actually only one term in there, and it's relatively easy. These x's are, are, are not so bad things to write down. Okay. You should think of this relation now as letting you pull a t through a pair of strands. Imagine that you're in the braided case. You can certainly pull t's through strands just by using the braiding to pull the strand over, and then using the, the Kalkman formula for a crossing to resolve all the crossings. This is roughly like that, but sort of much worse. Uh, you can only pull through pairs of strands, and the number of t's increases, which is... Uh, sort of disastrous. The fact that the number of t's increases means that it's really not obvious at first how you use this to evaluate a closed value. Fortunately, we can actually do that without giving a short talk here. Fortunately, there's a wonderful piece of scan theory that shows you how to use this relation to evaluate an arbitrary closed diagram. It's called the jellyfish algorithm. Um, okay. What do we do? We begin with this other container network of T's. So here I have strands labeled by integers. That just tells you that actually there are six strands connecting this T with, uh, with that T. And I'm drawing the shadings. Obviously, the shadings don't change when we go across the number of strands. So this is not a total change. But now, each of the T's uh, pick, a, pick a path to the, the outside region from, in, from, the, from an unshaded region on each T. Uh, I've drawn this here for all the paths that are just going to be straight up, uh, but obviously if you wanted to, you could be lazier. This T here is already at the boundary, so we could just put it out that way if we wanted to. Um, but obviously this, al this algorithm has lots of choices and we'll just make dumb and straightforward choices. Okay, now we just float each generator to the surface using that, uh, that relation from the previous page. So for example, when I first move this generator up, uh, I get some linear combination of different numbers of t's. So obviously by now I need to have a sum in here, and this really could have 0, 1, 2, or 3 t's there. But it's still the same sort of diagram, and so I can keep floating things out. The number of t's increases and increases. Uh, and so I've only drawn uh, uh, 9 t's there. You go back to the original one, look how many t's this is passing through, see how many strands. This passes through 10 strands to fuse that relation five times. So maybe we have like 3 to the 5 t's resulting from that guy. It looks like it could be a bit of a disaster. Um, 
But really, it's, it's all okay now, because diagrams of this form, where all the t's are in the outside region, are actually really simple to evaluate. The diagram looks like a polygon with uh, some diagonals drawn in, so the vertices here and the t's are just drawn in two different ways. One, so it looks like the picture on the last slide, and then the straight the other polygon. And the point is just that any such polygon has a corner. Uh, so here's a corner, uh, here's another corner, here's another corner. Um, you can do this many ways, it's very easy. Uh, if you had a corner, and the labels on either side add up to 16, at least one of the sides is labeled by an H. And that means that somewhere in this picture, there are two T's, that here and here, connected by eight strands, and so we can use the T squared equals the jones mental item term relation uh, to remove those two T's, reduce the number of T's in total. And when you do this, replace those two T's, the resulting diagram still looks like this, all the T's are at the you, you haven't, uh, no T's have gone inside, you've never wrapped temporary leave strings around the outside or anything like that. So you don't need to use the jellyfish step anymore. You just keep looking for corners and, and removing pairs of teeth. So the first step, we produce heaps of teas, and now I can just kill them pair by pair. Um, I guess that's it. Uh, yeah, we evaluate all diagrams. So we know that we've got a subfactor planar algebra. So we know it's the right thing. Thanks. <laughs> one more. One more. Questions, <laughs> 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 please. So, you can assume you can do the same thing with double the U and 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 the U and